Uh, good morning. Thanks very much for um, joining us again this week. Um, I think um, in um, Erica's absence, I thought it'd be really good just to sort of have a, a general catch up, but also just to talk through some of the announcements um, that have been made and also some of the rumours that are circulating around um, apprenticeships and just see what um, impact that's having on, on everybody and maybe just have a further discussion um, around um, delivery models and how they might be evolving um, um, as a result of um, um, COVID-19 and, and the restrictions and, and the best way forward. Um, so I thought it would be good just to get um, um, everyone's views on the announcements, first of all from the PM in terms of um, the apprenticeship guarantee um, and or work experience um, guarantee for I believe it's under 25s um, and what impact you think that's going to have on uh, apprenticeships and then secondly uh, I think we're waiting for a formal confirmation but the suggestion that um, and I think this is um, already running in Wales and is similar to um, the uh, age grants um, um, that have been around for some time, but is a um, suggested £3,000 per employer for taking on an apprentice. And again, what impact do you think that's going to have in terms of apprenticeship starts going forward? Any views? Yeah, so I think, um, I don't know if providers are ready for that just yet. All I think some will be. Um, I think we've got to be really careful that we are also getting the right people on program because if we're not careful, it could have an impact with um, leavers very quickly. Um, and also, and, and I don't know what you think, Christine, but the three thousand pound. I think a lot of employers will will relish that and will like that idea. But you know, is that are they going to then select the right person? and have the end goal for the learner in mind you know with regards to employing them at the end of it and um, having them as a as a member of staff i just i'm just a little bit concerned about the um, the incentive there although it's got the right um the right thoughts behind it it's it's it's, it's whether we use it properly i think is my concern no i agree with you there sarah and i think really the driver of that is going to be the provider mm -hmm. um because it it even if an employer takes a young person on as an apprentice <coughs> and they um they may be doing it to get the three thousand pounds if that is engineered effectively by the provider and the right message is given to that young person about their contribution to the business. And this is an opportunity for them to show their value and they have the right approach to actually doing that apprenticeship. Then as long as it's the right apprenticeship to support the business, then I think there could be a chance because let's face it, if you were, uh, if you were an employer and you had this young person that was shining in your business through an apprenticeship, wouldn't you try and keep them on? But it's it's all about mindsets, isn't it? And I think I think you're right. I think absolutely that three thousand pound is going to be a massive incentive for the employer to take a young person on to put them down the apprenticeship route. But if they don't fully understand what endpoint assessment is all about and their their sort of contribution in that, then they they could be doing it and almost wash their hands of it and, and say yeah. to the provider, you know, right, it's your job now to train that person. And I think yeah. the onus is then going to be on the provider to make sure that they really do give that added value because mm -hmm. otherwise you're right, the, the apprentice will leave or they'll get to the end of the apprenticeship and the, they won't there won't be a job there and it'll just be bums on seats and, yeah. and that's not good for anything. It's just that whole behaviours and values piece for me um, of, of, you know, we, we want to put people on programme that we have a vision for um, not just to develop, but to keep in our business, you know, to, to be an, a, a person within the business that's going to add that value um, if we develop them. And, and you know, it, it, 
it, I have a, just a little bit of a fear of it going back to sort of the YTS days where, you know, you, you had sort of like somebody for £35 a week, £40 a week. And then at the end of it, some of them got a job, some of them didn't. And although, you know, it's a very tricky one because I can actually, I really can see why the government are doing it, how they're doing it. And it's a massive, the good thing to do. We just need to get those behaviours and values right. Yeah, I agree. And also, I think, you know, um, it's one of the things that I've been banging on about for a little while, because businesses need to be thinking about the future and the fact that we are going to be coming out of the, um, the EU. And we need to stand as a country, we need to stand on our own two feet more. And for businesses to be strong, they need to be thinking about the future, they need to be capacity building. And this is an opportunity for them to capacity build. Because if they invest in a young person, the chances are that that young person might stay within their business for a very long time. And that can help them to be able to grow and be stronger going forward. But I think one of the challenges are a lot of businesses are firefighting right now mm. and, and they're, they're, sh they're um, pulling their horns in and a lot of big businesses are shedding staff and those who are shedding staff are going to find that it's going to have this little bit of a, uh, it's also almost most bittersweet, isn't it? If you let mm. thousands of people go because you're shedding staff and then take loads of apprentices on, it leaves a bad taste, doesn't it? It does, and also what they're doing is 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 um, shedding the people with all that experience and the structure yeah. and everything, and then they're bringing in new people, which means that their management structure and their you know their core people that they've got left with have got to you know be really strong and take that responsibility and be passionate about training people that are coming in, and like you said, that's going to be quite bittersweet for, for, from a lots of points of view because if you've lost four of your team and then you get two apprentices in that are less experienced, need support, need development, that's that's more work, you know, bread and butter really it, it, for the for the person. It also depends as well how secure the people who are left behind feel. Because yeah. if they feel that they're on thin ice and they might be next, then that's not going to put them in a in a positive position to yeah. be able to then support other people. I think it's it's really, uh, really, really uncertain. Again, it's you know I touched on it. I think um, when I was talking to Linda last week, you know that that it almost feels like uh, the same as when we were going into COVID. You know that 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 uncertainty and yeah. as things were unfolding we're in a similar position now coming out the other mm. side and nobody really knows i mean who'd have thought that leicester would get locked down again and now bradford has been locked down again so there's, there's all this you know and um and i have, i have to admit i had a panic attack in tesco's last friday when i was doing my weekly shop because it's like nothing had happened to a lot of people and and yeah. they've got a one-way system around the, the store and people were coming at me the wrong way on the one-way system taking over the aisle so there was nowhere for me to go and mm. and i nearly walked out and i'm not somebody who's a bit flaky and and just like gives up you know and, and i just think there's this weird like mindset and i don't know I think it's really strange times i do yeah so so <clears throat> I think um, just to add my my two pence worth, I, I, I absolutely agree that um, coming out of, if I can term it that way, coming out of um, the, the, the lockdown and the restrictions uh, around COVID-19 creates as much uncertainty as when we entered. But I certainly think that um, certainly within this group, um, and within the sector overall there's been a lot of positivity so oh, yeah. um you know and opportunity in terms of grasping the opportunity to um embrace technology change delivery models change engagement <laughs> and, support. Um, and i think that's that's been really important i i welcome the fact that um government is focusing on apprenticeships you know that apprenticeships is that high up the agenda and again, equally, as both of you have said, um, I think it's, you know, it's important and um, to recognise that we understand why the government's doing that. Of course, it anticipates we're going to be entering into the biggest recession that we've ever faced. Um, um, you know, levels of unemployment that perhaps we 
we haven't seen before. But that's, that's looking at worst case scenarios. In terms of the decision making processes for businesses, um, again, they are going to be in the same situation where it's going to be an opportunity for them to look at their current business model and what changes are, are needed and using this as an opportunity. I absolutely agree with the point that um, you know, we need to make sure that whatever decisions those businesses are making in terms of taking apprentices on are for the right reasons um, and are not taking advantage of any incentives um, that are available, which is like just purely because of the incentive. Mm. Um, and um, therefore, it's no different to any other incentives that have been offered before. Yeah. However, what is different is the rationale behind it. And the rationale behind it is to try and uh, jumpstart uh, businesses, recruitment, apprenticeships as, as one of those routes that businesses can take. And I think that's, that's really important. And, and I, I agree with you, Paul, but I think one of the differences that we've got here now, and, and I think, you know, going back to past experience about um, the message that goes from either the provider or f even from the tutor. So um, just take, for example, maths and English, because that's a, a headache for lots of providers. So you've got a tutor who doesn't feel confident with maths and English. The message that they push to their learners very often is that maths and English is important, isn't important and is something that can be put off until a later date. They don't really understand themselves the value of the constant integration and development of that and so the learner doesn't get the full picture and it's that same kind of messaging because what is very different now and that i think we have to be very mindful of is endpoint assessment is not a framework and you can't guide somebody through an apprenticeship ticking boxes to get to the end and say well done you've achieved it we can't be in that space anymore and the employer has got to have a lot more say and a lot more input because otherwise we'll get the apprentice getting to the end of their apprenticeship and they don't have the level of mastery confidence or competence in able to successfully achieve that endpoint assessment and then if they fail and the onus is then coming back to the employer to pay that additional reset are they going to want to you know because that that whole piece is a different journey and i think i absolutely take on board what you're saying and i think it, you're absolutely right but i think there's so much more onus on the provider now to get that right and i think there's still a lot of providers that are still in that nvq you know signing off assessing mentality and that's got to change anyway and, and do you not think christine that that was there pre-covid oh gosh yes yeah definitely but this isn't as a result of covid no 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 but that, no. that 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 um that situation for some providers um like you say that that change in mindset that change of understanding the transitioning from you know old world of frameworks to to, to new world of standards um w w was there anyway and you're saying that that that's that's going to continue to be there are, are you saying that um now that we've we're going through and have gone through COVID that that's somehow magnified that issue? Well, um, potentially, because if, we, if we've got this situation where an employer takes on an apprentice because of this £3,000 incentive and, and either the provider and or the employer doesn't really understand the new world of endpoint assessment and what will be required of them, and it's not managed effectively. I think this is where there the could be um, a bit of a challenge. We've got lots of messages coming in the chat box here. Oh, <laughs> I think something weird went on there, possibly with Sarah's keyboard. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just think for me, I've always seen the, the challenge with going from frameworks to standards as similar as going from key skills to functional skills, because it's that same kind of end assessment. And, um, and that was painful. That was painful for a lot of providers to actually get their head around. And, and some of them are still not fully in the space of giving the learners the right level of support to be able to be able to achieve the functional skills at that first time and that's why we see first time pass rates are so low they shouldn't be there's no need learners really shouldn't be put in until they're ready to take that test 
um and so i think you know i do see something similar and and that that's not me me being a doom merchant because i'm i'm not from that um kind of um mindset really i'm i'm more of the mindset of saying you know this is real and and this needs to be addressed we need to be able to move this forward um, we don't want lots of learners going through an apprenticeship of maybe a year, two years, whatever that might be, and have a bad experience that when they get to the end of it, they can't achieve that framework and, and that or that that mark of a, a being able to be successful in that role. And I think if that is engineered properly, the, the phrasing that is around, you know, the employer um, signing off to go through gateway is that the employer is confident that the learner has got the knowledge skills and behaviors and is confident and competent in that role and i think that's the key because that role needs to have value to the business but they need to have been developed into that role properly and i think that the onus is going to be very much on the provider and and provide almost a different level of service than they've provided in the past in order to make that work and and not to not to sort of beat up providers because there's some really good providers there and and as you actually you, you quite rightly said paul there's a lot of positive stuff there's um you know the the sector is very good at responding to change and, and making those adjustments and especially independent training providers are are very good at, at sort of morphing into whatever is needed um but it, it, i think it's that whole piece of a different approach because we've possibly got assessors and tutors as well who are not confident in what they're doing going forward because either they've been furloughed or you know they've been through experiences with throughout this whole lockdown that has maybe changed their perspective and changed them and and the provider needs to be able to manage that as well so, so, I'll, so I'll shut up hey <laughs> no not so but, but what i'm hearing christine is 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 what you're saying is is look that even before covid there were still issues with the transitioning to the world of standards for providers and and those issues shouldn't be forgotten is what you're saying absolutely yeah. absolutely um, and, and i totally agree and i totally understand and, and and some of the issues that we've touched on over um you know the weeks and months that we've been doing these these weekly sessions around endpoint um and around um you know staff um support and the transitioning plans etc i absolutely agree and they would still be there and i and i guess some would argue that that's the role of the ESFA and Ofsted and DFE and, and, and the like to ensure the quality of provision is there and in place both um, through the providers um, and employer providers and through the endpoint assessment organisations. Uh, um, that, that in itself is a different challenge though, isn't it? Because um, they, because of their role, they are auditing what's already gone and and they can't necessarily influence what's happening now because everything they do is almost retrospective isn't it um so yes they can well, ofsted can go in they can do a check and and then they can put some findings forward and and all the rest of it but that doesn't help what's gone in in this interim and there's only so many inspections that Ofsted can do and we won't be going to see all providers you know I think I think it's something that all providers need to be really thinking about you know thinking about what their offer is how they package it how they're supporting employers to be able to make this transition because if they can do that then I think that will really strengthen the provider for the future and and what they can offer Mm -hmm. because you know if, if you if you as an employer were to have a provider that gives you above and beyond service that helps you strengthen and grow your business and bring some really good apprenticeships through their business to help them to really make the most of the opportunities there because in every crisis there's opportunities you know it's that that balance isn't it and I think those providers could then just absolutely shine and, and really shout from the rooftops about what they can offer and, and how they um, support people to be able to bring their businesses forward. Yeah, and, and um, again, using that same analogy 
um, and you mentioned Ofsted. Uh, we know that uh, Ofsted inspections um, have been suspended. I think there's been some announcements around um, uh, schools in particular and when Ofsted will be um, uh, starting uh, inspe this inspection regime again. But certainly, um, certainly the last announcement I think I, I saw was that for the rest of the remainder of this year, um, Ofsted inspections for our sector um, were on hold um, um, and maybe reviewed later in the year. Um, but, but that gives Ofsted the opportunity to provide that support to the mm. sector in the meantime. Um, and again, I acknowledge what you're saying that they only look at things that have already happened retrospectively, but they are comparing to that, that against the expectation. And the expectation yeah, is very clear in terms of what's, what's needed. Um, so I think there is an opportunity there. Um, I think there's an opportunity for the likes of Ofsted and the ESFA and DFE to look at what support can be provided. And I know there's, you know, organisations like um, the ETF that are, you know, um, uh, purposefully um, supporting the sector and providing um, various aspects. And then you have member organisations um, like EALP or, or Promote Ed and so on that are also offering support to the sector. But uh, um, I think you're absolutely right. For those um, organisations, and we'll focus on Ofsted, um, that have um, a clear understanding of what's expected versus what's currently happening, they're best placed to be able to support the sector going forward. Whether that's going to happen or not, unfortunately, is not your, your, yours or, or, or my decision, but certainly that is something that we perhaps we could, could look to, to ensure is fed back. Um, I think coming back to the, the focus, the government's focus around apprenticeships and, and the potential incentives there, as I mentioned earlier, I still, I still think that it's a, a very good thing because it raises the profile and the option of apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. I absolutely accept um, and agree with your point and Sarah's point that, you know, that's providing both the provider and the employer are doing it for the right reasons and in the right way. Mm -hmm. I, I also take on board the point that, you know, if an apprentice is taken on, will they then be retained after they've completed and achieved their apprenticeship? And I, I guess that's always been an ongoing debate and discussion. Um, I guess the argument could be given that if that individual has um, been taken on and employed and gone through an apprenticeship and gained the required skills, et cetera, and experience, that that puts them in a better place Absolutely. at the start, regardless of whether they continue that employment with that employer. Um, and yes, you know, if, if that employer decides not to continue and then start with another apprentice, the argument could be, you know, is that in the best interest for, for everyone? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm sure that there will be people that will argue both sides for that. But that will be that, that business's decision in terms of how they will We'll, we'll look to do that and, and, if, and that's you know whatever distance in the in the future isn't it um and there is that time in between and i think i think you're right i think it, i think it's, at the end of the day it's about proving value isn't it yeah um and and i think well hopefully and it's good that as well because yes it's important that young people are given opportunities um it's sad for the sort of the 25 plus because they need opportunities as well um, but yes, you can see why they're, they're sort of supporting the younger, younger sector. And I'm sure that, you know, I've no doubt that, you know, we're focusing today on, on, on apprenticeships, but I'm sure that there is going to be a far wider support offer through um, um, uh, DWP and Job Centre Plus and um, all of the employability providers out there in terms of other packages that are both going to complement um, um, and, and apprenticeships might be one um, uh, route that individuals can take. But there'll be many other um, support packages and alternative routes that, that individuals will be able to take regardless of, of, of age. Yeah, and of course there's still the levy pot to be spent as well, isn't there? There is, and, and, and you know, there's been lots of flexibilities, um, you know, um, increased flexibilities around the levy pot and how levy can be spent. Um, absolutely. And again, I think that's only for the benefit of employers and in particular um, smaller employers um, that, that would like to, to engage with um, apprenticeships. And the same way with 
Uh, and I know there's been a delay in terms of um, the amalgamation, shall we call it, of, 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 of um, uh, DAS and both uh, levy paying employers and non-levy employers being on the same system. I think that's delayed until the uh, end of March next year. Um, so, so those with non-levy contracts, those contracts again are going to be extended. Um, and we had the pilot earlier in this year. So again, you know, all of that are positive steps in terms of trying to increase um, apprenticeship engagement and apprenticeship starts going forward. I'm sure as well that uh, certainly the devolved um, sectors uh, or the devol devolved areas, they're going to want to um, shore up their own um, areas as well. And I would think that they will be promoting all of this to encourage it, to make sure that there isn't, you know, greater than necessary um, depression in their areas. Um, and this is a good route for them to be able to promote the opportunities for young people and encourage employers and, um, in, their, in their areas to be able to um, really push this and, and make the most of it. And, and I suppose as well, because it's a government initiative, at the end of the day, the, the devolved areas such as Greater Manchester, they are still an arm of the government. So if it's a government initiative, then they're going to be heavily encouraged to promote the government in initiative because the whole idea is around growth. So, you know, there are there are sort of things probably going on behind the scenes that we're not as aware of. And and that could all help to make this work. Uh, you're absolutely right, Christine. And in fact, some of the um, uh, concerns that you've got around such an incentive being um misused and abused may actually be being addressed um you know and, and we may see that when the announcements are made and you're right and you you gave greater manchester um, as an example i know that west midlands combined authority you know have done a lot of work in terms of levy transfer so taking control of um, levy and then um, taking applications out and also then promoting apprenticeship opportunities to um, uh, providers for example on behalf of of, of larger employers I think um, what is really encouraging is that, that they are promoting apprenticeships. Yes. You know, uh, T levels have gone quite quiet. Um, colleges and the academic route has always been there. But one of the things that has been, I think, um, a, a little bit out of balance has been um, the way that apprenticeships have not necessarily been promoted as heavily as the route for young people to take. And, and I think these initiatives and these drives are putting apprenticeships well and truly back on the map. Um, and I think it's really, really good for the brand. And, and let's just hope that all the other niggles that are, are there in the background, things like, you know, there aren't um, standards for all the occupations that are felt to be really necessary and, and sorting out endpoint assessments so that employers don't have the headaches of taking on, on an apprentice. And that can be a positive experience for them if they especially if they've never had one before um and so i think it's really positive for the whole sector um you know around all, all this this piece yeah, yeah, absolutely and there's been further announcements um i certainly picked up this morning i'm not sure if it came out today or yesterday um but esfa updates around existing um apprentices um and specifically those that um have been made redundant during covid and again, um, you know, I think some very welcome um, updates uh, and guidance there. So if an apprentice is within the last six months of their apprenticeship, the ESFA will now fund the remainder of their apprenticeship to complete. That's good. If, if they are uh, within the last 12 months of their apprenticeship, the ESFA will fund 12 weeks and then they have a 12 week window in which then and they can try and find a new employer who will then take up and pay for the remainder of their, their, their apprenticeship. So that funding will be based on the original negotiated price with the first in, uh, in employer. So, you know, you can see that, you know, a lot of thought is going into and there's lots of guidance coming out to try and support the existing cohorts of apprenticeships as much as possible and providers. Um, um, as well as looking at how can we stimulate you know apprenticeship starts going forward to the benefit of um, you know businesses um, who are clearly going to be going through some some continued turmoil 
for some time to come. So um, I don't think it's, you know, um, I don't think it's going to be a case of, you know, we're going to have all of the right answers or it's going to be one size fits all. But I certainly think that as many, you know, opportunities, as many um, potential solutions are being presented, you know, is only going to benefit, I think, apprenticeships going forward. And as you say, it's going to be good for apprenticeships and good for the apprenticeship brand, providing it's done in the right way. No, absolutely. But then I suppose, you know, at the end of the day, um, that's always a caveat, isn't it? You know, anything really can work or not, depending on whether it's done in the right way. So, yeah. yes, we've got very interesting times ahead, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned there as well about colleges in particular. Um, obviously, we're now in July. So normally they would be um, completing their summer term in the next couple of weeks and then would have the summer break. Um, and then be looking for um, um, enrolments in September. In fact, you would anticipate that uh, most colleges would have a good sight of um, their potential enrolments for, for September. So there's lots that they're trying to deal with at the moment as well um, in, in terms of moving Definitely, forward. Definitely, because their, their feeds won't be quite the same as they, they were either because, you know, um, it, it's always astounded me that you've got somebody uh, in year 11 who's going for their GCSEs and the amount of, like, um, taster days and, and college visits and everything they, they're doing in this really, really crucial time of trying to prepare for their GCSEs. And, of course, all of that will have been halted because... A, the colleges have been closed, but B, the schools have been closed. So the schools won't have been feeding people in. And I know some people have got places at colleges already, um, if that's the route they're going to go down. But I can imagine there's quite a few young people who haven't gone through that, that process. And, and it's actually going to be a real challenge for the college to be able to capture this probably very widely scattered group of potential young people to come on and take on board their courses because the career guidance will have taken a little bit of a slide as well so there there is uh, there's challenges in in every every part of this isn't there really from the education perspective yes yeah and and again there's there's been um, further guidance around um how schools and colleges are going to return in september um and and what um that's going to look like and i think that's um again been um uh, tricking out this week um and, and i think there will be um some formal updates um by by uh, secretary of state um hopefully by the end of this week um in terms of what that looks like i, I was hoping um um adam was going to be able to join us because um i certainly know that he um uh, on LinkedIn had made um, some um, interesting comments and observations around um, the new um, regime that providers are going to have to enter into in terms of um, the workforce and remote working and how you manage that um, in, dare I say, the new world going forward, um, you know, versus, you know, what happened before. So um, maybe that's something that we can take on to uh, the next session. Uh -huh. um, so I think that's really important because, you know, um, I, I think nothing is going to be the same as it was. You know, uh, I think there have to be, you, you write about the remote working and, and I think um, with the remote working side as well, then that's potentially um, putting some additional pressures around GDPR and making sure that you know if people are working at home that the, the environment that they're working in make, is secure for that um, information so that it doesn't get into the wrong hands and you know all this kind of thing really i i, th I just think yeah it's there is so much that needs to be considered um it's a really really challenging time on on lots of fronts it is and, and you know for for, for organizations that um didn't operate um you know a, a remote or, or home working uh, regime yeah absolutely there's going to be lots of things that they're going to need to put in place um i keep pointing out um the risk assessments that need to be continuous risk assessments that need to be done for staff for learners for employers etc 
and, and for everyone to, to ensure that they are talking about that to make sure because um, particularly in our sector where we're working with different employers in different environments where they will all have their own sets of procedures um, and it's making sure that you know our staff are aware of that and are kept updated and are following um, those those procedures to keep themselves and everybody else safe um, but also then you know in terms of that um, um, management of and we're not just talking about in terms of performance management we're talking about you know health and well-being here as well of of, of staff um, and making sure that they're you know that they're okay that they're okay with the new regime um, um, and whilst it works very well for some people and their work-life balances and they're able to 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 cope with that um, um, or, or have worked in that way before there will be many other individuals who will really struggle and will really find it difficult um, and won't be able to cope as well with the use of technology versus face-to-face -face and that type of engagement and, and it's going to feel very different for them and it's how how you know organizations how businesses how employers manage their teams to ensure that their staff are are okay Mm, definitely i think hr is going to have a much uh, stronger role to play in in making sure that people are um well you're absolutely right i mean um my stepdaughter she's uh she works for one of the gas companies and so she's been working at home since march and she's been really busy making sure that gas is supplied to all the um all the hospitals and everybody that needs it and, and you know um has been very very busy and now it's started to slow down and she's been told that she's not going to probably be able to go into their offices for several months because she's not classed as being an essential office worker because she can do her work remotely and she lives on her own and she's climbing the walls she's absolutely climbing the walls and and it, i think it's uh, it, i think what you're saying about making sure that that people are being looked after but if you've got quite a big workforce then that is quite a big task for some for somebody to do yeah. and and i think there needs to be somebody in the hr department that will take that on board and that is their job making sure that people are okay because even though you might have managers that are making sure that their team is okay what if the manager's not okay you know it's it's that whole piece isn't it really it's uh, there's a lot of unknown but i i agree with you i think um mental health going forward uh it's it was already becoming something that was quite big on the agenda and i think mental health and well-being is really going to rear, rear its ugly head um in the next coming months and, and possibly years because you just don't always know what the impact of a crisis like this has on people and a lot of people will have suffered bereavement as well. Um, and, and also, you know, they could have suffered um, financial hardship because where somebody may have been furloughed or they may still have been working. And so they're OK. But what else has gone on in, in their home? You know, like you might have been fine, but your wife, she she might have lost her income. And most families nowadays live to what the income is coming into the home. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that in itself. I mean, Steve and I were in the position where the, there was no benefit for us. We couldn't claim universal credit. And I think you can easily fall through that net to having had a reasonably comfortable lifestyle on two salaries. Suddenly, you've got to manage on one and, and you've got, you know, family to raise and bills to pay and all the rest of it. And, and that in itself is going to have an impact on the individuals and their ability to work effectively. And I think those kind of things are going to be real concerns that need to be addressed and managed. I think, um, you know, all employers are going to have a bigger responsibility towards the people that they employ. Yeah, agreed. I've got on a few soapboxes this morning, haven't I? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
Um, I'm just conscious of time, Christine. It's um, coming yeah. on to 11. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to raise or, or discuss? I don't think so. But I think, you know, because people do listen to these recordings. And I think, you know, uh, I don't want it to sound like um, that I'm being really negative about this. I'm, I'm not. You know, I think there is, um, I think some of the incentives that are coming out are fantastic. And the initiatives are coming out are fantastic. And it's really going to help to sort of, reinvigorate uh, the apprenticeship brand um, I just think it needs to be managed carefully and if it's managed carefully then you know it can have such a fantastic impact on the whole economy in this country and strengthen it as we move forward to stand alone as a country on our own outside the EU trading um, because I think there's going to be huge opportunities for this country you know I think Every, the whole world has been struggling with COVID. It's not just us. And so everybody will be trying to rebuild. And, and so I think, as I said, out of adversity, there is just as much opportunity. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely agreed, Christine. Um, so so the, the last thing um, that I want to, to say is, um, Erica and I have um, put out to the group in terms of um, how frequently these sessions um happen going forward and also what's the best day and time and we'll never get it right for everybody but um, um so um i certainly think fortnightly is the way to go but we'll we'll make an announcement and put it out through through the group yeah that seems to be the popular option yeah um so whether it stays on the thursday or moves i think potentially a wednesday's been muted as well um then, then we'll we'll uh we'll, we'll get that agreed and um and out to the group anyway but yeah, um, thank you very much for today, Christy. Oh, thank you. Have a great week. And I'm sure we'll speak soon. And you take care. Right. Thank you. Bye.